So I respectfully acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. The Musqueam, there goes my light Squamish and the Salé with Tooth uh, nations and that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is on the territory of the Musqueam people. I know that um, some of you are going to be joining us today from many places, near and far, and I acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. We have our housekeeping slide up and do note that this event is being recorded for public use and is going to be posted on the website of the college and you'll receive a link uh, after it's been posted. In terms of uh, the afternoon, we're gonna have a short business meeting and then a presentation by uh, Ben uh, Schneiderman with uh, questions and answers uh, moderated by Paul Steinbach. So I have a uh, short report, but with uh, very good news. And that is that Dr. Valerie White has volunteered to become the Emeritus College newsletter editor. Val retired in June 2017 after being in the Vancouver General Hospital system since 1980. Her career established UBC and VGH as a world-renowned center for ophthalmic pathology. She is recognized internationally for her role in deciphering eye malignancies with the early use of molecular biology tools. In addition to her professional service, research and teaching, Val has led and continues to lead a very active life with boating, bicycling and traveling extensively. She brings to the college a strong interest in creative writing which led her to complete the prestigious Writer's Studio program at Simon Fraser University and write her first novel a few years ago. Val will be a most welcome addition to our communications group. And Carolyn Gilbert, who stepped up to put together a terrific newsletter last month, has very graciously volunteered to work with Val during a handover in the summer. So thank you again, Carolyn. I've also been asked to clarify that there will be two speaker events with Green College next week. You received notice in the email alert last week of the Thursday, March 30th event on disciplines over time, which will be on molecular biology. But on Wednesday, the 29th of March, a new series is being launched, uh, which is going to run uh, through the academic year of 2024. And this is on psychological trauma and resilience, which extends last year's series on the intergenerational effects of psychological trauma. The first presentation next week on um, Wednesday is by Peter Sudfeld from the Department of Psychology. Peter is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an officer of the Order of Canada. I'm now gonna hand this meeting over to Dr. Steinbach to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, Anne. It is a real pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Ben Schneiderman, our speaker today. Ben is an emeritus distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland. His specific areas of interest are human-computer interaction and information visualization. He is the founding director of the Human-Computer Interaction Laboratory and a member of the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland. He has received six honorary doctorates in recognition of his pioneering work. His widely used contributions include the clickable highlighted web links that we all use, high precision touchscreen keyboards for mobile devices, and tagging for photos. As a physician, it was interesting to me that he has also contributed the event sequence analysis for electronic health records. Ben has authored many books, and his most recent book, Human Centered Artificial Intelligence, which was published in February of 2022, was the winner of the Association of American Publishers Award mm -hmm. for Computer and Information Systems. Ben and his wife, Jenny, have been living in Vancouver since early 2020, and he's made he has significant connections to UBC. 
His daughter, Sarah Schneiderman, and her husband, Mark Turin, are both associate professors in anthropology at UBC. Ben is an adjunct professor in the UBC Computer Science Department with his main UBC contacts being Professor Emeritus Alan Mackworth and Professor Tamara Munzer. Today, Ben is not going to talk to us about his professional work at all. He will talk instead about his uncle, who was a famous photographer. I met Ben for the first time by Zoom when I attended a talk on this subject to another group. He, I was quite enthralled by the talk, and I thought at the time that members of the Emeritus College would enjoy a similar presentation. So I'm very pleased that Ben agreed to address us today and welcome him to give his presentation titled, My Uncle, the Legendary Photographer, David Seymour Shim, 1911 to 1956. So I hand you over to Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was a very kind introduction. And thank you, Anne, and others for organizing this event. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yes, uh, my wife, Jenny, and I have been very happily uh, here in Vancouver, where she's originally from, and we had daughter Sarah, husband Mark, are both UBC anthropology professors, and live just 10 blocks away from us in Kitsilano. So um, we've been quite happy here. And I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about a personal story about my uncle, the legendary photographer who lived from 1911 and had a tragic ending in 1956. It's a story of love and adventure and successes and creativity uh, and tragedy. Uh, and that's maybe a good lesson for our times as well. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. The, on the bottom, the website, uh, davidseymour.com, will give you lots more to look at and read and links to lots of information that I mentioned along the way in this talk. So uh, my uncle was born November 11th in Warsaw, Poland. And this is the standard famous picture by the photographer Elliot Erwitt um, that tells his dapper style, um, his owl-like chess player uh, mood, his gentle, warm connection, uh, and his always elegant dress uh, with a, a jacket, tie, and, and sweater. He was part of a circle of important people. And here you see him with Robert Kappa and with Henri Cartier-Bresson. The three of them were really close, like brothers. And their story is quite interesting because they are their strength was in their diversity. They were very different personalities from very different places. And their trajectory in life was very different. Both my uncle and Robert Kappa were killed while photographing before they were 45 years old. And Henri Cartier-Bresson lived to age 96. So very different stories, and that's what we're here to talk about. And it goes back to the early 1930s, where you see my uncle Shim walking with my mother, uh, Eileen Schneiderman, or born Halina Shimon from Warsaw. They had come to Paris in the 30s, which was the intellectual center um, they were eager to join in the, the political and social movements of the time. They were both engaged with the academic world, the Sorbonne, and so on. On the lower right is the picture of my father with my mother, who married in 1933 and were in Paris as journalists. That was their focus. And my uncle, David Seymour, picked up the camera to make that his profession and join the movement that was turning photography into the mass media of its time. He made these charming photographs of my sister, of my mother uh, in Paris, and it demonstrates the early ways of his capacity to connect with his subjects and engage with them in ways that they jointly created the portraits. He was originally from Poland, as I mentioned, and you see here his original Polish uh, documentation and coming to Paris and then picked up uh, his camera and began to work. And he photographed in Paris the Front Populaire, the popular socialist-oriented movement. And you see on the left side a worker's strike at a, at a, a steel factory and other demonstrations for um, anti-war demonstrations and 
and parades in, in Paris. And that style of parade continues to this very day in Paris. Now, if you look at this photo uh, on the left of the steel workers, you'll see the raised fist and its outstretched form. And it's a little bit of visual training to know what to look for. That was the movement of the socialist um, communities and the Front Populaire, and very different from the Nazi salute, which was the outstretched hand with the fist raised. So you'll watch for that as we go through these pictures. He went early on after covering the labor movements in Paris and publishing and becoming something of a celebrity in the Paris world. He went to Spain in the 1930s with many others to cover the Spanish Civil War, a great turmoil. And many people see parallels between the Spanish Civil War and the current war in Ukraine. Here, there was a fight for the independence of Spain, away from the influence of uh, Hitler and Nazism, um, and this great movement that brought remarkably tens of thousands of volunteers from all around the world to join in this movement as, as fighters. And his photographs from the battle scenes to preparations to the refugees were quickly published in Paris. He would take his his Leica and photograph and then take the cassettes, the 35 millimeter film. This was the new technology of the 30s. Go to an airport somewhere, find someone who was flying across the Pyrenees to Biarritz. Then they would get on a train and take the train to Paris. And within 24 hours, these photographs might be published in the news and magazine of the time. One of his most famous pictures is this one from the Spanish Civil War. And it became a legendary photo, which Time magazine called one of the 100 most important pictures of the 20th century. And it shows a woman looking upwards, nursing her child with a few people around her, tightly cropped. And this is the image that was constantly republished. It got a reputation that was incorrect. It was used on the cover of a magazine with a German Luftwaffe bomber flying overhead, and it became known as a kind of response to an attack by Germany, and by German Air Force. However, it was a labor union rally. That's what Schindler's photograph. And it took 70 years till we recovered the original negative. It's a fantastic story of how the negatives were sent by Schim and Kappa in the late 30s to Mexico for safekeeping because they felt their work would be destroyed by the Germans. And only after a long story did we retrieve these photos and the 5,000 negatives were then studied carefully and then we found the original negative, which was a broader shot. And so the movement from the heroic individual to the socialist masses is what you see in this different interpretation of this photograph. Now, just this morning, I had a remarkable email leading up to this talk from a UBC professor, uh, Robert Belton, who I'm looking forward to hearing more about. And he tells me a story that I never knew about that may or may not be true, but he conjectures that this photo was a photo that Picasso saw and influenced his photograph of his, his painting of Guernica, which then Shim photographed later. So we'll come to that picture a little later in the in the, this slide deck, but take a look for right now and try to remember this woman's agonized look upwards to the sky, her eyes squinting, her mouth open, and this picture of what appears to be anguish. And let's see how it returns in Picasso's Guernica. And you can make your own judgment as to whether Guernica was influenced by Shim's photographs. So Shim, after the Spanish Civil War, he managed to get out to go to Mexico uh, by boat and covered story. Then he came by train across El Paso and into the US. And during the war years, he was in the US Army as a photo interpreter. and. Um, uh, came to England, and here he writes to one of his girlfriends, to Lucy, starting a ride in the future. And he adopted the name Shim. The family name was Shimin in Poland, S-Z-Y-M-I-N, 
but he chose the abbreviated easier to say shim, and that was the way his photographs were identified and credited. And so this is from 1944, and you see his master sergeant's um, uh, arm uh, embellishment that tells the story of his wartime years. And after the war, he picked up his camera again, and he went on an important story that may be his most famous story is his trip for UNESCO in 1948 to photograph the children of war or the children of Europe. Uh, he traveled to six countries, shot 267 rolls of film, and then UNESCO created this 50 page book that's a rare collector's item at this stage. Um, and it shows the story. I'm going to show you some of the pictures of the children who were in various homes and camps. Here, a, a theme that he's repeated in many of his photographs, children in a circle dancing in front of the ruins of the, not sure what building or church or castle, but the contrast between the life continuing and the destroyed life of the past. He was exceptional on this connection with the people he photographed, especially the children. This charming, altogether too cute, and some say sentimental photograph of the child with the doll on the left, and then the two children on the right, where their doll has is barely a doll, the head is gone, and merely the torso remains, but they're holding, that child is holding that, that, um, that doll. And they're sort of scraps of clothing and poverty, and yet they were there, they were present, and they allowed Shim to photograph. You know, kind of imagine what happens in the 60 seconds before the photograph, how Shim might have walked up, smiled, made a you know encounter with these children, showed them his camera, and then proceeded to work with them to take the photo. And that's what you'll see here, this remarkable photo at an orphanage in Italy, where there's a, a dozen 10-year-old boys or 12-year-old boys. And every one of them is looking at the camera. Can you imagine getting 12, you know, all this crowd of boys to all be facing and engaged with him? What did he do to engage them and produce this photograph? Again, their clothes are soiled and rather limited. There's sort of anguish on their faces, but they're there telling their story. The girl on the left, a little bit questioning with her bowl of soup, but she's present as well. And this may be his most famous picture um, of Tereshka, a troubled girl after the war. And her name, the Tereshka name is on the top of the blackboard. And she, with the other children, was asked to draw a picture of their home. And this troubled girl, the best she could manage was the scroll on the blackboard. And this picture has been captivating for many, many people. And it's become the cover of dozens of books on children here, cultures under siege, collective violence and trauma, war orphans, developmental psychology. And so it's become an international legend. So much so that a few years ago, I was contacted by a German philanthropist who was creating an a, a orphanage for the children of Rwandan refugees after the Rwandan Civil War. And he asked if he could use the Tereshka image and the name Tereshka Foundation, or Stiftung in German, to, uh, for his foundation. Of course, I agreed to this, and he's been a great supporter in his work. I'm, hope, I'm pleased is advanced by, uh, by the use of this photo and, and the story. Carol Degar, a writer, created a fictional novel, a short novella, Tereshka and her photographer, imagining how Shim and Tereshka met and how they worked together to create this image. Many people see trouble in this girl's eyes, and some say, I could never have this photo on the, in my living room. Others are drawn to it, and psychiatrists, psychologists who work with children say, I want to put this in my office. This tells you the work I do. And so this picture has become legendary to the point that 
a Polish team of um, investigative journalists spent three years trying to track down Tereszka to find out who she was and if she was still alive. They made an hour-long documentary that tells the story of how they tried to find the Tereszka in the, in the uh, uh, orphanage that Shim had visited outside of, of Warsaw. Eventually, they find out what happened and that she had been traumatized by war and, and, and injuries during the war and lived her life till, about, I think, age 38 in a, in a clinic in a home. But they found her brother who told, her, told them the story of Tereszka and what impact that Tereszka image had within Poland and beyond. The image continues to draw attention. Here, uh, Shim's photograph was a uh, version, a different frame was donated to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and the Washington Post covered that story in 2019. So that story continues to, to go. You can see more about Shim's Children of War on this video on Vimeo that tells the story of how he traveled and how he made the photographs and what the impact was. The UNESCO uh, component uh, was important in that book, is considered by many to have been influential in gaining the US support for the Marshall Plan, the plan to rebuild Europe, including Germany, after World War II. Uh, it just created that strong an image and a sympathy among people. Shim continued his work and working for major newspapers and traveling the world. He at first adopted Italy as a home, um, but I remember him as this gentle uncle who came to visit in New York and brought me books and gifts and told me stories. But my relationship was a bit thinner with him. My sister, who's older than I, uh, has more stories to tell about her time uh, with Shim and how he taught her to be a young woman, what kind of drinks to order, <laughs> what kind of clothes to wear. He became infatuated with Israel in its early days and traveled there every year, eventually hoping to buy an apartment there. Uh, but these are some of the stories. This picture on the left for me is a sort of strong woman looking back to the past, but confidently striding to the future with her rifle over her shoulder, going out to guard duty at whatever, um, you know, pioneering post this was. This photograph is, will, will be part of a sale by Magnum Photos, the organization that Shim and Robert Kappa and Ari Cartier-Bresson founded in 1947 that continues to be world leading organization. Um, uh, in the photo journalistic tradition. The picture on the right shows, shows the birth of a first child in Israel at a, a kibbutz of Italian families. In 1996, the BBC sent a camera crew to Israel to find the father and the child and interviewed them at the time about their story. This photo is the sense, the great sense of pride of the father over the child. And it's been used by companies in their advertisements for new products, their pride of their new product being reflected in this image. This is another great picture from his times in Israel, the chuppah, the traditional marriage um, cloth over the young couple, the rabbi marrying them. And in this case, the chuppah being held up by a pitchfork and a gun. In fact, it's such a remarkable picture and a remarkable moment that Shin was so capable of finding that some have questioned its veracity and believing that it was staged and prepared. He just didn't believe that a Western news photographer would happen by and all of these things would be just in the right place at the right time. But I believe that it was, and that's the way these guys work. They did believe that a single photo could change the world, and sometimes it did. And so that's the kind of work they did. He was famous for his photographs of personalities because of his capacity to relate to others. So you see on the top, Toscanini with the death masks of Verdi and Brahms, and on the bottom left, Bernard Berenson in the Borghese Gallery, 
staring, uh, almost bringing to life with his stare the stone statue that he's looking at. Now, here it is on the right. Picasso in 1938 in front of the image of Guernica. Um, and Shim took this photo. And I never thought about it, but yes, it's possible. There is the anguished expression of the woman we saw from the Spanish um, photograph, Spanish Civil War photograph. And she's looking skyward and in this anguished pose. So I don't think we can ever really find out, but Robert Belton tells me he and two colleagues have written a paper describing that potential connection in ideas of how photographs influence art and then art influences photography. So for me, the charm and, you know, every few weeks, something like that happens where somebody makes a new observation and makes a new discovery about my uncle's work and the stories keep building. Another great story. He photographed in, in, uh, in, in Venice, Peggy Guggenheim, this famous picture of her by her home on the Grand Canal. And actually in October, Jenny and I visited, went there, uh, and it was really a nice experience. So this picture is quite famous. Um, Peggy Guggenheim was a kind of, um, I don't know what to say, rebellious young woman, uh, and, and maybe no, famous because her father was, was died on the Titanic and she became the inheritor of a modest amount of money. Uh, but she used it to buy great art and her Peggy Guggenheim connection, collection in, in Venice is one of those great historical collections of the 20th century. But the story comes when I get a phone call from Magnum, which licenses the work of, of, of uh, Shim's collections and in, in New York, Paris, and London. And Diane calls me and says, Ben, there's going to be a play on Broadway about Peggy Guggenheim. And they want to use your uncle's photographs for the, for the publicity. It'll be on every bus stop. It'll be in, the, you know, everywhere you go. I said, great, Diane. Why are you calling me? Don't you usually handle this normally? She says, yes, but uh, there's a little difference this time. They would like to take this photograph and colorize it. And it was to be done by a, uh, a photographer, a painter at the time uh, that I knew, whose work I knew quite well. And I laughed and I said, oh, that would be fun. Okay. And I said, as long as they put the captions that identify the original photograph, and here it says on the side, so the says photograph, you know, illustration by John Ritter and the photograph by David Seymour. And then she points to the second question. She says, um, one more thing, Ben. They want to replace Peggy Guggenheim's face with the face of the actress, Mercedes Rule. <laughs> so I laughed again. And I'm quite engaged with the idea of these popularizations. And so I agreed to it. But I said, I have a request as well. I want four tickets for opening night. And I want to meet Mercedes Rule. And sure enough, we went to New York to do that and join the play, which was a great uh, pleasure to see. So it's fascinating for me how photographs change over time, how they influence people, how they're put to work in new creative ways. And that's one of these wonderful stories of Peggy Guggenheim. Sophia Lauren is another important story. Shim's photographs of Sophia Lauren. This young woman of 20 years old in Rome posing for him in this very, you know, uh, I don't know what to say, cheesecake uh, way uh, was quite nice. And she came to like his taking her photograph and invited him to be photographer whenever she was doing a Hollywood based film in, in Europe. And this is one of the examples of those photos of her her posing and teaching Shim how to do this kind of photography. I don't think a Hollywood publicist would allow this kind of photograph in the hallway to the kitchen in a Rome apartment where she's sitting on a kitchen table and posing in this casual way. But her look is compelling. And uh, I think it makes for a dramatic uh, photograph that uh, uh, 
everyone likes, the men especially maybe, but the women find it alluring as well. Ingrid Bergman was another favorite subject and she often invited Shim to photograph her family and she wrote him a letter, which is you can see on the website that I pointed you to, it says, I make beautiful babies, you make beautiful photographs. And so she insisted that he come and photograph her. And these photographs became really important part of the culture. The one on the bottom center was used uh, in an 85 foot blow up for the Cannes Film Festival about a decade ago. He also photographed Joan Collins and Kirk Douglas. Uh, and Audrey Hepburn was another favorite. Um, her charming looks and her just made her popular with many Magnum photographers, uh, including Shim. So this was when she was photographing Funny Face in, uh, in Paris in 1955. Maria Callas is a, yet another story, the famous opera singer. And <laughs> I guess about... Five months ago, I get another phone call from Magnum that says, Ben, your uncle took pictures of Maria Callas. I said, yes, I know. I said, it's her hundred, the hundredth anniversary of her birth. I said, okay, great. And the Portuguese government, I thought she was Greek or Italian, but the Portuguese government would like to put out a stamp of Maria Callas and they'd like to use the photo, the color one on the right, for their stamp. Is that okay for you? <laughs> and so I laughed about that. And I said, yes, that was great. And I said, please send me the stamps when they get issued. So I'm waiting to see those. Gina Lola Brigida, who recently died, was another famous uh, subject of his. And Shim was in the circle of people, including Marilyn Monroe here at the 21 Club in New York City. So he had a quite glamorous life you can see him always in his suit and tie and, and, and white shirt. Um, but here, to make it personal, is, you guessed it, that's me in New York at, what do we say, about uh, six, seven, eight years old, somewhere with my sister and my mother. And these are pictures taken by Shim, of course. Uh, so he had a capacity to connect with us as well. And you see it here in this photo. So the end of his story is the sad one of going. He was president of Magnum, and um, Robert Kappa had been killed in, by stepping on a landmine in Indochina while photographing. And when the Suez crisis broke out in 1956, um, my uncle found a way to get to Suez by flying through Cyprus um, and then on to Suez. And then these are a couple of the pictures. The one on the left shows really interesting composition of these diagonal lines and the shadow of the boy, the turret of the gun and the gun of the, of the itself and the boy moving here with a certain trepidation. And I get an email from a Russian, from an Egyptian historian who says, your uncle was a wonderful man, a great man of peace. And I would like to use his photograph in my history of the Suez crisis. And he says, this photo particularly is important to me because the man sitting on the tank is his brother because, and his brother died in the Suez crisis. And I agreed to that. And he ends his note. He says, Salam Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. And then he says, what a tragedy that your uncle was killed by British gunfire. Well, that shook up my sister and myself because we understood the reports that he was killed by Egyptian gunfire. And it was four days after the armistice already. So it should have been safe for him and Jean Roy, the photographer from Paris Match, to drive in their Jeep uh, along the canal to come to an exchange of prisoners. But somehow they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the Egyptians opened up fire and killed them, uh, both of them with many bullets, a tragic, difficult to read description of their death. On the right is a twist in the story. 
while I'm struggling with the Egyptian historian who tells me that my uncle was killed by British fire, I get an email from an Australian who says, I have your uncle's last photograph. I was a paratrooper in Suez in 1956. Your uncle drove by in a Jeep with another photographer and asked for directions. And they told us what they were out to do. And I gave him my camera, and it's the man on the left, gave him my camera and asked him to take a picture of the two of us, which he did. And he said the Jeep drove off and 20 minutes later, we heard this burst of machine gun fire and we heard that your uncle had been killed. And I write to him and I said, can you tell us if this was British or Egyptian gunfire? And so he goes and checks with his buddies and, and, the, and the Australian and, Egypt, and, and English forces, British forces, and comes back in a week and he says, no, none of the people I spoke to knew of anything like this. Some months later, the full report appears in the French paper, uh, Paris Match, which describes the Egyptian gunner who had killed my uncle. Uh, and so it's a rather brutal and sad ending. Here is there in the field there, the French flag over the Jean Roy's casket and my uncle here. And you can see there's a, you know, a rabbi, a military rabbi in front of, of that. And so that's the sad ending of my uncle's story. But his work lives on. And it's remarkably influential and satisfying to me how warmly so many people uh, feel about the work of my uncle. And these are some of the books. Uh, here, he was quite enchanted in his time in Italy with the Vatican and religious rituals all around uh, Italy. And he did a book, he did the photographs for a book with Anne Carnahan about the Vatican. And this early book of his photographs shows one of those festivals around Italy, a snake festival with these young children, three years old maybe, playing with uh, a snake very calmly and comfortably. Both of these books have become rare collector's items, um, which uh, people hunt for. And I found this copy, this battered copy of Vatican, just remarkably at, 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 a, at a, a, a yard sale uh, in Connecticut while driving there uh, one summer. The main books probably to look at are the coffee table book, uh, of Shim, the photographs of David Seymour, written by Inga Bondi, who worked with Shim for many years. Uh, and it features the uh, Bernard Berenson at the Borghese uh, uh, photograph, as does the other one, Faden's collection. Um, uh, the first one, the 1996 book, is quite hard to find these days, but there's more copies. It was a larger print run of a book by Tom Beck which has a nice short biography and then it's standard format of 55 photographs in chronological order, but exceptionally good captions written by Tom Beck that tell the story. So you may be able to find those around. And the exhibits continued. I mentioned the Mexican suitcase by which the photographs that Shim and Kappa sent to Mexico in 1938 disappeared but then reappeared in 2007 <clears throat> and were recovered and brought to New York. And when they were, it was the full front page of the Sunday New York Times Arts and Leisure section telling the story. And then a few years later, the International Center of Photography in New York, a museum founded in memory of my uncle and Kappa and others, tells the story of the Mexican suitcase and its rediscovery with uh, their photographs. There's an hour and a half film about the Mexican suitcase that tells three stories about the photos, about the Mexican War, the, I'm sorry, the Spanish Civil War, and then the impact that the Spanish Civil War has had in Mexico and those who left Spain to come to Mexico. Exhibits continued. Um, ICP did a retrospective on Shim in 2013. Um, and that's information still on the website. Books began to flow uh, in English, in French, in Italian. 
uh, telling parts of Shim's story. The Children of War remains an important theme. Carol Nagar wrote that book, and she also wrote these French versions, uh, and others have continued. Um, I've donated materials of my uncle's work to the U.S. Library of Congress 10 years ago and another batch just a few weeks ago. So they are the steward for some of the work. Majority remains in ICP in New York, but I found Library of Congress, which I've worked with for many years, to be a, a good steward for his work. They scan all the images. You can look for those images online and uh, see the, the work that he did, uh, and they're available for researchers for many purposes. Uh, in March 2017, there was an exhibit in Tel Aviv, um, and both my sister and I spoke about our, our uncle and told some of the story. That exhibit was beautifully installed and include newly discovered color images from Israel in the early 1950s. It was one of those other dramatic discoveries. We were doing research here, the curator at the top, Asaf Galai with my sister, <clears throat> and with Asaf, we were in New York at the archives of Magnum Photos, and the remarkable librarian, Matt Murphy there, who, who we ask about some you know, photos. He goes to the cold room, comes back a few minutes later, triumphantly with two folder foils of Kodachrome images that no one had ever printed or seen before. And so within Israel, these color photos became the centerpiece uh, for that exhibit. And uh, it was quite beautifully installed and ran for more than a year. Um, in Amsterdam, a version of the exhibit uh, appeared in 2018. And here, daughter Sarah, some of you I hope recognize her, she's at UBC now. Uh, but she came to represent the family and tell the stories there. Uh, in France, uh, in 2018, the city of Paris put up this plaque uh, uh, to commemorate Robert Kappa, his girlfriend, Robert, uh, Gerda Taro, and David Seymour Shim, um, who were pioneers of, of photography, of war photography, uh, celebrated for their images. Uh, of the Front Populaire and the Civil War in Spain. So this is on the building where they shared an apartment and did their, their darkroom work. Um, and it continues. The Illinois Holocaust Museum currently has a 51 print exhibit, um, which goes on for another year. I was recently there in January and spoke about my uncle. Um, and that will continue if you are going to Chicago or have friends there. Uh, they can see this quite uh, well done exhibit of modern prints um, that uh, tells his story in a very good way prepared by ICP. And I'm working now to have that exhibit travel to another museum um, to start in, in late 2024. And I'm working with um, the Image Center at Toronto Metropolitan, formerly Ryerson University. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Let me stop that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, they will do an exhibit about the UNICEF project. I've donated original materials from that uh, story to uh, support that exhibit. Uh, and so that that's something to look forward to whenever they finish that by 2024. So that's quite wonderful. And I think the highlight I'd like to feature to you is the new book by Carol Nagar. Um, it's been her life work to, um, to do the research. And she dug very deeply to prepare this book and wrote very poetically uh, to tell the story called Searching for the Light. Uh, I have arranged... I hope it's available now, but for the Vancouver Public Library and for the UBC uh, Library to have copies of this in at least electronic form and hopefully paper form, but it is now available and has had about a dozen really wonderful reviews and commentaries launched by the appearance of this book. Plus, we also prepared a video. I mean, I do receive funds from Magnum's licensing of his materials, and that goes back into these book projects, to the websites, to making videos, and so on. So 
I see it as my responsibility, but I see it as my pleasure also to tell the story of my uncle's work. If you want to find more, davidseymour.com is, is the place. There's a set of portfolio photos uh, and then other photos, an album of about 40 of his images there. Uh, there's a few of the videos are posted, but then it has links to books and writings and materials that I've used to prepare, including the archive site has 600 letters written to him or, or by him, to my mother, to others, and uh, back and forth. There's even a, uh, there's even a telegram when I was born uh, and <laughs> saying that he was so proud to be an uncle. And so that was a, a very nice story. And that's the end of my story of my uncle, the legendary photographer, David Seymour, who lives on in the minds and hearts of many of us who appreciate him as a person, but also for the work that he did that was so influential to other photographers. So that's my story. And I'm glad to take questions and appreciate your interest in staying with it here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, what we'd like to do is stop the screen sharing, if we could, please. Thank you. And again, uh, a wonderful personal talk about a fascinating uh, person whom your uncle was. But thank you again. I enjoyed it for a second time. And uh, there are some questions that have come in from the chat. I will go through those first, and then I will... Let me see if I can find them. I had them before. Here we are. So the first question that came uh, is, is from Peter Sudfeld. There's a Spanish Civil War with a fascist revolution against the Republic, which was defended by pro-democracy fighters, but also an anarchist, communist, and other left-wing groups. How is that similar to an invasion of democratic Ukraine by an autocratic Russian government led by a former Soviet secret police officer? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think people feel that the will of the Ukrainian people to have an independent country uh, is being threatened by an outside, um, I would say, you know, undemocratic force and the belief of the Spanish workers and others were that they wanted to preserve a, a nation of the people. And so many people have been making that association. And interestingly enough, my father and mother accompanied Shim or traveled together in Spain. And my parents were writing about that. And my father wrote a book in 1938 uh, about the Spanish Civil War, which has recently been translated and reissued in Polish, in Poland, in Spain, and shortly will appear in English in the U.S. So the interest has somehow come together in the last few years, and part of the explanation is because people see a linkage of similarity to Ukraine. I understand the point of this question, is that there seem that there's if you look at the politics, you can see it as a very different situation. I don't know if Peter wants to, Peter Sudfeld wants to reply. Peter, did you have any comment back? You can unmute yourself and just comment. I guess not. And the next question in the chat, I think you might have addressed this, is how and why did David Simon adopt the name David Seymour? Yes. So uh, his Polish birth name was Dawid, D-A-W-I-D, Shimon, S-Z-Y-M-I-N. Um, and uh, he was the son, that is my, my grandfather, was a famous publisher in Warsaw. And so it was a well-known name and their home was a sort of cultural center, especially for the Jewish community and writers, including Isaac Besheva Singer and other well-known well known writers. Um, so he went to study printing in Leipzig um, and then came to Paris to continue studying, um, but he switched to photography. And once he became um, known in photography circles 
and his work began to be published, he did not want to use the name Shimon because he feared that it would bring some kind of retribution to his parents back in Warsaw. I think we're talking about the mid-19 and late 1930s. And so he switched to the name Shim, C-H-I-M, um, as his name. When he came to the U.S., he, his naturalization papers and his military papers used the name David Robert Seymour. Okay, so the David is like Dawid, so that's understandable. Robert, I don't know for sure, but it seems like his close relationship with Robert Kappa left him with the desire to use the name Robert Seymour. Robert. And then Seymour was a name, popular name at the time. I think he adopted that just as a sort of, as, as a name. It was a time when people were changing cultures moving around the world and changing identities. So Robert Kappa was an adopted name. His birth name was Andre Friedman. He was Hungarian. But when he came to Paris, he took the name Robert Kappa. Some of the stories suggest that he was trying to make it American sounding so he could sell his photographs more easily. And Kappa was supposed to be like the, the Hollywood um, producer Robert uh, Frank Capra. And so he took the name Kappa. Um, and there's lots of stories about uh, Kappa and Shim, um, including, um, uh, I'm blocking on the name, but there's a novella about them, the 80 page novella about Kappa and Shim that tells their personal story by Hemingway's third wife, the journalist. I care about blocking on her name now, but okay. Um, anyway, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of legendary stuff there about the changing of, of identity. So that's how the identity change comes. Um, let's see. I see George Sanders says there's a book called The Girl with the Lyca by Helen Eschick, which describes a scene in Paris during the Civil War with the war ph photographers, including Kappa and Gerda Taro, I think. It also explains how the negatives were sent to me. Yes, right. So there's several no novels and various forms of history and attempts to make uh, uh, films and videos. And so uh, I, I would say the one to look at for now is The Mexican Suitcase by Tricia Zinn, a 90 minute uh, documentary that tells these three interwoven stories. I appear briefly in that film as well, um, but uh, The Girl with the Leica is another. There's a few other Kappa is certainly the more celebrated figure. He became known as the world's greatest war photographer, and his photographs from the D-Day landing are what we think about. It's a famous story, but with a name like the world's greatest war photographer, uh, you get a lot of reputation. He was a glamorous character. <clears throat> he had uh, intimate affairs with Ingrid Bergman and with others. Um, his girlfriend, Gerda Taro, was tragically killed. Uh, in, in the Spanish Civil War, and that really tore him apart. He never really recovered from that and never had an enduring relationship either. And again, in, in, as I say, his ending was equally tragic in 1954 in Indochina, stepping on a landmine. And uh, such was the time of these photographers uh, and some of their tragic endings. Um, what else? Marvin Westwood, this is a great presentation showing how skilled your uncle was in his life, and I think it must be inspiration to many of your family who have come after him. Yes, I think inspiration in many ways. I considered being a photographer as my career, <clears throat> and I worked with Cornell Kappa, the younger brother of Robert Kappa, in cataloging the uh, archives of Robert Kappa. Uh, I had access to the Magnum world. I continue to be part of that uh, circle uh, of, of remarkable photographers. Um, and uh, I considered being a photographer, but actually it was Cornell Kappa who talked me out of it. And I chose to be a computer scientist, which served me well. Uh, and I've kept photography as my hobby, photographing my colleagues at work, at conferences. And there are a few exhibits online at the Computer History Museum and the Charles Babbage Institute uh, at the University of Minnesota. 
of my photographs of, of my my professional work and they continue to be published tragically when some of my colleagues die but there are key figures and my photographs have appeared in Forbes, New York Times, Glamour Magazine, and so on, uh, that tell the story of some of the colleagues of mine that I had the, the good fortune to come to know about. Yes, I think many in my family are inspired by my uncle. One of my cousins, a younger cousin, is named David after David Seymour. He was quite beloved by those who knew him, and a British historian who reviewed the condolence letters at the time of my uncle's death said he'd reviewed many such, you know, packages of letters, but he'd never seen any, had never seen a collection with such warm, uh, warm feelings towards my uncle. So uh, that's a kind of nice, uh, nice story. Um, let's see, Peter Sudfeld replies, thanks for the answer for the fascinating talk and photos. Spanish case was a civil war to some degree, a proxy war with foreign helpers on both sides, German and Italian governments backing the Franco nationalists, Republicans being supported by the USSR, at least supporting the communist groups while stabbing the anarchists in the back. See George Orwell, <laughs> Ukraine case is a foreign invasion of an independent country which is defending itself with help from other democracies. I see the democracy versus autocracy analogy and the interesting part that this time the ex-communist is the overt aggressor. Yes, the Spanish Civil War was extremely complex and I thank you for your, your clearly informed understanding of it. I must say I lose track of the different movements and different fractions or fragments of the, of, of the Republican side and the Franco nationalists and who's who in these in these battles. But interest in the Spanish Civil War has risen in some parts, a number of new books and interest in my uncle's work from the Spanish Civil War and my parents' writings have, have, have grown. And again, I think in part the similarities that people see to Ukraine are, are in their mind. Let's see, Alan asks, how can you protect your uncle's legacy images? in an age of generative AI stealing images for synthetic purposes? Well, Alan, thank you for the question, which steers me to my professional side. Um, I can't protect my uncle's legacy of images. Um, the images are on websites all over. Magnum makes an effort to chase down those who illegally use my uncle's work. But, you know, I don't object if some college student uses a photograph in, a, in one of their class reports. Um, but, you know, when the Washington Post used the photo, actually the photo of the father in Israel holding up the baby, um, the Ma Magnum lawyers went to the Washington Post and asked for a license fee and they, were, they received that. So legitimate publishers don't want to break uh, and steal the photos. And so that part is, uh, you know, we do the best to keep under, under control. Uh, but um, the synthetic purposes, and this takes us to the whole world of, uh, of, of Dolly, uh, Dolly 2 and the uh, stability uh, AI and uh, mid-journey and other uh, image generation tools, which use as their training data, I don't like that phrase, but they use the images um, to um, as a basis for generating new images. Uh, the Getty uh, Institute with 12 million photographs is suing Stability AI for their use of their photographs. And we may yet see that these organizations that use image generation um, based on older um, images, we'll have to pay some fee, but it's difficult to see how to arrange that. And so that remains that remains an issue. Uh, we could go a lot deeper into this, Alan uh, and others, but um, I my, my role I see as to preserve my uncle's work, that the original vintage prints, which are valued by museums, and researchers, which have often annotations on the back and which are historical objects, that those are placed in responsible museums. And I've worked with, as I've said, you know, the 
Toronto Image Center, with ICP in New York, uh, with uh, George Eastman House, with uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington, with Library of Congress in Washington, the de Young Museum in San Francisco, uh, and other museums in Victoria and Albert in London. And so I donate my images, the ones I have. I have about a thousand of the vintage prints still in, in my possession, uh, but the modern prints are also being made by Magnum. Um, I mentioned that is the, the young woman carrying a, a, a rifle over her back. Um, that will be in the upcoming uh, Magnum Square print sale by which they make small prints available for a limited time, a week only. I think it's something like April 12th through 19th that they make them and then they sell them for I think $110 US and um and so they're reasonably priced for collectors or $200 frames something like that so those you know and and Magnum will sell modern prints of some of the famed images for higher prices for collectors or others who use that so um there, there continues to be interest in a market um, my efforts are mainly to donate to these, these institutions and work with them to preserve and promote my uncle's work. Anything else? We still have time. If there are any other uh, questions that people have that you want to put in the chat. Well, I wish to thank Ben again for a uh, most interesting and well done presentation. I wish to thank all the uh, participants for joining us today. It's been uh, wonderful to see so many people here online. And thank you very much. Until the next meeting, I think, uh, Queenie, are you going to put up a slide that we can have a look to do with the next uh, meeting? There we are, some upcoming events. And you can see that the next uh, annual general meeting is on Wednesday, May the 17th at one o'clock. And Dr. Robert Krell will talk about ethno-political violence views of a child Holocaust survivor slash psychiatry. I realize that I have two of the previous square print sales pictures in the background behind me all the time, but that's the Ingrid Berg, that's the uh, Audrey Hepburn, and there's a Sophia Lauren. So that's the format of these. Uh... In any case, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll bring the uh, meeting to an end. Thank you very much for attending.